welcome welcome everyone um, can everyone hear me okay welcome everyone to the connecting art histories across uh, africa and asia event before i get to the event i wanted to uh, my name is iftikhar dati at uh, cornell university and i wanted to um, alert you to upcoming events uh, that uh, we are having uh, as well so the next event we'll be having is uh, actually on um, october 14th through the institute for comparative modernities which is anti racism activism and institutional change uh, with a um, with a russell rickford who's a professor at cornell and student activists um, uh, and uh, the same day we also have another event uh, through the south asia program uh, co-sponsored which we are co-hosting with Mark um, in, in India, which is uh, called Art in the Age of Blockchain, with the uh, uh, curators Beth Citron and Diksha Nath in co conversation with Rizio Yohannan, who is the publisher of uh, at uh, Mark magazine. Uh, the next uh, event uh, through the South Asia program is uh, by Barry Perlis, uh, 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 and uh, it's on the astronomical observations of Jai Singh. And finally, uh, but at the end of this month, October 26th, we have another event called Hindu Belonging and Minor Minority Recognition in Pakistan, um, um, which is uh, by, uh, uh, organized by Natasha Raheja, who's a professor of anthropology at Cornell. Um, so now let me uh, get to the, um, uh, let me get to the, to the event and, uh, which is uh, why we are here today. Um, so connecting art histories across Asia and Africa is, uh, uh, is um, brought together international faculty and emerging scholars. Um, to, uh, it was initially conceived by Diana Campbell and Amara Antilla and was developed as a partnership with, um, uh, with Dhaka Art Summit. Um, and uh, Asia Art Archive and Cornell Institute for Comparative Modernities. Uh, and it was, it was generously supported by the Getty Foundation's Connecting Art History Initiative. Um, the founding of art schools and academies, uh, salons and art societies, um, and, um, and writings on art and architecture in journals, um, newspapers mark significant developments in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Africa, and from the late 19th century. Uh, through the 20th centuries. These processes were uneven, but they mark the emergence precisely of, um, of uh, modern art and architecture that uh, is required for its production, circulation, and reception. Uh, but uh, we need much better accounts of these uh, developments than have been provided um, by many nation state based surveys so far. Research in this region demands careful and patient work, including an awareness of social and political history, languages and literatures, and other cultural conceptions the artists and artists engaged with. In short, analysis that respects the formal properties of the work, but also situates it in reference to the intellectual and social developments of the time. Comparative approaches can be very useful in critically situating local and national developments, as well as recognizing their transnational dimensions. Um, shared questions include the legacy of colonialisms, the founding of modern art, um, and um, architecture schools, museums, exhibition venues, the roles of uh, criticism and writing, um, and um, the place of tradition and crafts in and against uh, modern art, relation between national and transnational developments, decolonization as both aspiration and reality, and the play between form and society. So the Mahasa project sought to address the urgent need for training uh, resources and networks expressed by actually scholars in the region. Uh, so for example, art and architectural history theory and criticism is, um, is uh, rarely taught in most African institutions. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and also in India, in art history, uh, instruction is limited and dominated by canonical approaches and movements and genres, and also kind of a national narrative, right? And uh, in Southeast Asia as well, due to infrastructural and funding 
limitations, the teaching of art history requires an inventive, imaginative, and collaborative approach. Um, Mahasa emphasized a connected and contextualized approach to better understand both the common developments as well as divergent uh, trajectories and including, included two 10-day intensive workshops uh, uh, in uh, Hong Kong in August of 2019 and in Dhaka in February of this year. Uh, participants actively engaged in the sessions as emerging experts in their own um, disciplines uh, by presenting two papers, they, they were also encouraged to develop their work. Field trips to collections, museums, and modernist architecture, and guest lectures were organized during both the Hong Kong and Dhaka sessions. So Mahasa was taught by six faculty, um, six faculty members who include Elizabeth Georges, Ming Tiampo, Salah Hassan, Sanjukta, Sundarasan, Simon Soon, and myself. And uh, we, uh, we enrolled 21 participants um we, who are um who are here um we made special efforts to include participations um based in Af asia and africa in addition to those based in europe and north america uh, these are primarily advanced graduate students and junior faculty who are engaged with important and understudied research questions um and uh mahasa program was also supported by um by Asia Art Archive and the staff of Asia and researchers at the Asia Art Archive, which who are uh, uh, Chung Dai Wo, Michelle Wong, Nupur Desai, and Sneha Radhawan. Um, the session today comprises of short presentations by eight of the eight of us, basically. Given that we have uh, limited time, the coverage will naturally be very partial and, and selective, uh, and in summary. Uh, Asia Art Archive is planning to host uh, an additional event in December, probably, details of which should be available in a few weeks. Um, I wanted to thank, um, for more details on the participants, uh, you can, I refer you to this website, um, uh, which is hosted by the Dhaka Art Summit, which gives the bios and uh, 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 concept note of the, of the project. And, um, I want to thank our Asia Art Archive team for hosting Mahasa in Hong Kong, especially its director, Claire Shu, and Chair Jane Debois. In Dhaka, the Dhaka Art Summit team, especially its patrons, Nadia and Rajib Santani, for their generosity. Uh, this session is sponsored by ICM and the South Asia program, and, um, and, uh, which, uh, and has been assisted, um, helped by Ashley Stocksill of ICM, Daniel Bass of, um, of um, and Claudia uh, Lemus Chavez of the South Asia program, uh, who have helped to organize uh, this session. So the program today will begin by uh, uh, following my remarks. Uh, they, uh, John Tain and uh, Diana Campbell will uh, will speak. After that, there'll be presentation by four of the participants, and finally, faculty member Ming Tiampo will will conclude this session. Um, and uh, uh, the bios for um, uh, for these, uh, we will uh, very briefly mention, people will introduce uh, themselves, but a uh, sort of, uh, you know, a little bit longer bios are here. And uh, now in regards to process, uh, if you have questions uh, for us, please type them in the Q&A prompt uh, at the bottom of the screen. And uh, we, we hope we will have time to address, uh, you know, some or all of these questions at the end of the session. So welcome everyone. and. Uh, now I'll hand over to John Tain. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Iftikhar. Uh, it's a pleasure to see everyone again. It's been a while um, after being together last August and uh, in February of this year. Um, it's nice to see some familiar faces and hopefully we'll be able to see each other uh, online, but also in person. Um, so for tonight, since I uh, have, we all have very little time, I'll just kind of jump right into it. Uh, I thought I, what I would do is basically give an overview of, um, 
uh, the Mahasa program as it took place in Hong Kong. It's uh, like all things, you kind of had to be there to really get the full sense of it. But hopefully what I'll be able to do is give you a, a little taste of what it was like and how exciting it was. Uh, for those in the audience who are not familiar with Asia Art Archive, Asia Art Archive is an organization that was founded in the year 2000. So it's our 20th anniversary uh, to support and promote research and recent art uh, and art histories of Asia and uh, understood very broadly. As such, um, I think the, the chance to collaborate on the project that promised to really bring together um, emerging scholars in both the South and Southeast Asia uh, regions, but also together with um, uh, younger scholars in Africa as well, working on Africa as well, was a very exciting one. And this was something that you know we were very happy to do a uh, work on with both uh, the Institute uh, for Comparative Modernities and DACA Art Summit. And um, hopefully you'll be able to see some of the, the, the excitement in what follows. So as Iftikhar mentioned, the, the heart of the program was really a curriculum that was developed as a set of uh, two 10-day, Sorry, I'm going to share a screen now. Here we go. Okay, so um, the curriculum was uh, the core of the, the program in each of the 10 day sessions that took place in Hong Kong and in Dhaka. And what I'll do in the time that I have is really just kind of give you a sense of what took place transpired in Hong Kong. Uh, this is a photograph of the main room in which we were all in. It's kind of amazing that there were 30 some of us uh, there for 10 days. It was kind of a really intense time to all be together in a relatively compact space, but that's very Hong Kong as well. Um, and this uh, so is on the first day when everyone was meeting each other. And the structure of the uh, curriculum was really kind of set up as um, a set of kind of um, different sets of activities. So there were presentations and seminars that were led by the faculty. So Simon Soon here uh, in uh, and they would kind of alternate between seminars that were individually led and then also um, team taught seminars. So this uh, the uh, faculty would also engage in kind of joint uh, seminars as well. But I think uh, one of the things that was really kind of the, the highlights of the program for, for me and I think for others in the program was the chance to be able to hear about the work of the particip participants themselves. Um, and uh, so you see here Andrew Malenga, uh, who uh, was working, uh, presenting on Zambian art in his, pre in his um, uh, presentation, as you see here. And there were various presentations that were based in kind of different um, regions and different areas that were people's expertise. Um, but what was nice was that also the chance to have the dialogue with each other and to speak with one another. Um, let's see here. Uh, this is Amy Sudin. Here, I'm going to switch to, here we go. Uh, oh, this is Greer, sorry. My bad. Um, Hmm. Okay. And uh, in addition to the seminars and the presentations by the participants, there were also um, activities that were uh, led by both the uh, AA uh, researchers, so there were workshops, as well as um, other exercises. So this was uh, an exercise that was devised by Simon Soon to think about the um, Atlas Memosine that was designed by um, Abby Borberg as a kind of a way for thinking about the kind of interconnecting uh, art histories uh, that all of us uh, were bringing to the, the convening. And you can see there were both digital and paper forms of, of this. Um, and I think what some of the most exciting moments were the, the, the kind of the various points at which both the, in the individual presentations and in the group activities, the notion of individual or national based um, art histories were being subjected or regional based art histories were being subjected to pressure and questioned. So you see here Kathleen Bietzig in a kind of particularly exciting moment. Um, thinking about what Southeast Asia is and thinking about how did this phenomenon come about. And you can see the timeline that she 
uh, was illustrating her talk with, you know, that kind of shows that there was a moment when Southeast, Southeast Asia, rather than being this kind of given, actually came into being. Uh, similarly, Taushif uh, in his presentation talked about Islamic unity in a way that kind of, you know, cuts across these geographical divides that we maybe think of uh, as being natural. And uh, Ming, Tempo, making the connections between different uh, um, cultural uh, periodicals and um, reviews. So we have here the Parea, uh, Lotus, Black Phoenix, and Sijia Wenshu. So four very different journals kind of thinking about the, the question of how to think about the world and how to think about comparison and connections. Um, but also thinking about moments of, <clears throat> of maybe unexpected um, meeting points. So here, uh, Kenji, uh, one of the participants, uh, showing us a slide. Uh, he had just kind of given a presentation about Buddhist um, projects and architecture and showing this slide uh, when Martin Luther King nominates uh, the priest uh, Thich Nhat Hanh for the Nobel Peace Prize. And so kind of thinking about the connections between the American domestic civil rights movement and kind of larger movements elsewhere. Um, and we also, thanks to Ming, engaged in an exercise working with Graph Commons and uh, as a way of mapping connections between the different uh, parts of the world. And so you see here uh, Nur uh, Khan uh, illustrating uh, the, the exercise that his group worked on where you can see you know, the Asia Art by, uh, Biennale connecting both to parts of London, Madrid, parts of Europe and New York, but also beyond to Japan and to Zambia. So that was what took place within the, the kind of the classroom or the seminar room. But um, as part of the, the curriculum at Asia Art Archive, we also designed uh, a set of activities that would kind of supplement or complement the, the kind of the, the seminar, which was already quite a bit going on. And hopefully uh, the, the um, participants were not too overwhelmed by it. They seemed to take it in good, uh, good cheer. Um, part of which was to connect them with arts professionals, many of whom were based in Hong Kong, but uh, some of whom were not. So in this case of the, um, the panel that we put together on Curating Place, a conversation across complex geographies, we invited some of the Mahasa faculty, but also um, people who happened to be in town. So Maria Lynn uh, Pereira, for instance, was a, a curator who was in residence uh, at Parasite from Raw Material Company in Dakar. Inti Guerrero, who is a uh, director at the Bellas Artes Projects in uh, Manila. And so, you know, it was a way of bringing um, uh, arts professionals from different parts of the world together in contact with one another. And also introducing them to the resources that are available in Hong Kong. So here you see a photograph of the trip that we all took to CHAT, Center for Heritage, Arts and Textiles, uh, to see the NS Harsha exhibition. And then a visit to M Plus, which uh, is uh, the institution. It's not a museum. It's an institution that is opening uh, next year. And you can see the construction behind, uh, behind the group. Uh, I think this was a really exciting moment, not only because we got to see in the exhibition that was on view and see the organization as it was kind of literally coming into being, but also because it was a moment for um, some of the participants to be able to kind of think about their own trajectories in the world. So in this case, um, Ifat and Debbie, who are both kind of working from a Sri Lankan perspective, meeting Suhanya Rafa, who is the director of, um, of M Plus, who herself is Sri Lankan. And so that was kind of a really kind of, I think, exciting moment of, um, of meeting for them, for the three of them. And also, I think beyond kind of connecting people, it's also connecting Hong Kong with the world and thinking about, you know, Hong Kong as being, ha as having a history that extends beyond the greater China region and 
thinking about its connections to Southeast Asia, to South Asia, and to Africa. And key to the, the, the kind of the, the aspect, that aspect of the curriculum in Hong Kong was chunking mansions, which many people who have never been to Hong Kong probably would have already known about through the film Chunking Express, uh, made famous by Wong Kar Wai uh, 1994. Um, and uh, as it turns out, one of our faculty members herself has a kind of personal biographical history in this. Um, but it was interesting to see that there was this kind of, you know, question of immigration that was um, worked in through the very beginnings of Chunking Mansions into its current status. So in the 19, beginning in the 1990s into the 2000s, it really served as a hub for a kind of a, a small scale globalization uh, for people who would be coming from uh, from South Asia, from Southeast Asia, and also from Africa. And so we made a visit to see the architecture and the community that was there. But then we also supplemented that with a film screening by, uh, of a film by Bo, uh, uh, Wang Bo and uh, Ban Lu called Many Undulating Scenes, which are uh, things which partly takes place in Chunking Mansions. And then also had a panel in which various people, including Ming, uh, whose family was involved in the creation of Chunking Mansions, um, as well as uh, Roberto Castillo, who you see here talking about kind of immigration trends and phenomena um, and its relationship to Chunking Mansions. So thinking about this as both a kind of an architectural construct, but also a cultural construct. Um, so in all these ways, you know, we really kind of tried to bring the various points about thinking about connecting art histories and modern art histories together. Uh, in the program uh, in Hong Kong. Um, and that in, in its turn led to the kind of preparation for the DACA module. And I think with that, I'll hand things over to Diana. Thanks so much, John. Um, it's really nice to kind of, you know, have these really wonderful memories. And again, like how wonderful that we could convene so many people in person in the midst of the Hong Kong protests and right before the world stopped with um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so we are different, we meaning Dhaka Arts Summit are a bit different from the other partners of this project in the sense that we are not an open everyday scholarly institution such as the Asia Art Archive or Cornell University or the Getty Foundation. Um, the Dhaka Art Summit is a large scale um, art event that happens now for nine days um, every two years. And um, we are a platform that brings together, it's, a, it's very much an embodied platform. We, we bring people together is what we do. So our last exhibition, uh, which finished February 15th, we had uh, nearly 500,000 people visit this exhibition within nine days. Um, so we bring artists, we bring writers, we bring curators. Um, it's kind of an expanded school. So there's education happening on many, many, many levels. So for children, for lay people who might have never seen a contemporary art event before, um, for arts professionals, for artists, but also for scholars, because we realize that there's so many histories in Bangladesh that um, people can't access. There aren't texts on them in English. Um, there aren't kind of commercial entities representing these. So they're not traveling and circulating in the world. Um, this is a beautiful um, performance that we realized in 2018 uh, with the Bangladeshi artist Ritu Sattar, which is called Lost Tune, which is speaking to kind of a South Asia wide phenomenon of a loss of musical traditions through the rise of globalization, but also um, religious fundamentalism. So I'll talk about this a bit more, but the summit really began as the South Asia platform, trying to link Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, uh, Myanmar, um, regions that have a deep and long shared history, but because of um, political uh, and ideological barriers, it was very hard for people and practitioners within this region to meet. But as time continued, we realized that only thinking within this, this South Asia regional format was not enough to understand the complexities of, um, of the context of Bangladesh, which has um, you know, many layers of global histories. This is an image here of a performance that we realized um, with Cora Kurt at Aronshai, um, which was called Together. And it was looking at um, the bleed of Naga myths across um, Southeast Asia, but these Naga myths also exist in Bangladesh and exist in South Asia. And I found, and um, there's a beautiful quote by Rustam Barucha about the Asias not speaking to each other. South Asia doesn't talk to Southeast Asia and East Asia is that the rich uncle that's so far remote that people can't talk to it. So um, as the summit developed, we just finished our fifth edition. We tried to make these Asias um, meet. 
Um, but it was kind of having a, we had a scholars weekend in DAS 2018, which I'll speak about in a bit. Um, but um, my colleague Amara Antilla and I realized that, you know, um, a lot of art historians write about exhibition histories, but they actually don't get to be a part of them. There's really like this kind of, again, bifurcation between um, kind of the practice of exhibitions and the study of exhibitions. So how could we bring these um, things together? And um, one of my students um, was mentioning, he was a member or is a member of the Collective Invisible Borders in uh, Nigeria, that, um, that they were very inspired by DRIC, which is an institution in Bangladesh. And though even though they hadn't met, this institution in Bangladesh had really um, inspired the founding of this institution in Africa. And this was kind of a light bulb moment that rather than focusing on kind of soft power initiatives, like there's a lot of, I mean, a lot of is relative, but there is funding to support exchange between the UK and Bangladesh, for example. There isn't, um, there aren't resources or weren't resources like immediately visible. We, we got them through the generosity of our patrons, the Samdanis and the Getty Foundation and the Asia Art Archive, but there wasn't a clear way to draw together these histories across Africa, South and Southeast Asia without taking Europe or North America as the center point. Um, and Iftikhar has exhibited as an artist in Dhaka Art Summit. He was part of the 2016 Scholars Weekend, or 2018 Scholars Weekend. John was also there in 2018, so was Amara. So we kind of built this up over time. Um, so this is an image of kind of the region that we were looking at when we started. Um, the summit started in 2012, but the South Asia focus began in 2014. Um, then in 2018, we started looking at this bleed across South and Southeast Asia, but also this is a, a map I love. I mean. Flight, path maths, uh, flight paths, I don't know what those mean today, but um, it was interesting that the national airline, Biman, was only flying to Kathmandu and Calcutta within South Asia. So actually, Bangladeshis traveling in South Asia was not an easy or um, common thing. It was far more connected to the Gulf and to Southeast Asia. So we started looking at those histories. But when you extrapolate it out even further, um, you know, I was um, working with the Argentine artist, uh, Adrian Vijal Rojas, who has uh, made this beautiful piece um, with, you know, uh, ammonite fossils. Those same fossils that are found in Morocco are found um, in the Himalayas um, and are worshipped as shaligrams. Um, but if you look at, you know, geological movements, the Himalayas, which span uh, South Asia, were, were created through a tectonic collision. So if you look even further back in time, what do these regions mean? They're shifting, the world is shifting. Um, so this is an image of Adrian's piece. The Dhaka Art Summit 2020 had, a, it was the first summit that had a title and the title was Seismic Movements. And it came through considering this piece um, but also a research project, which I encountered in Dakar in Senegal, um, called the Seismography of Struggles, which um, is a research project that's scanning protest uh, journals from the Haitian, non-Western protest journals from the Haitian Revolution up until 1989. And though even though people were separated by geographies, their struggles could be similar. So it's arranged chronologically, and you can see how maybe a Haitian rebellion and a Beng uh, Bengali farmer's rebellion could have a lot in common. Uh, and this was paired with the work by an emerging Pakistani artist named Madiha Sikander that was looking at um, you know, shared histories of um, labor exploitation across Canada and indigenous communities there and also with the colonial histories of Pakistan. Um, we also realized as we were building up the summit that contemporary art doesn't exist in a vacuum and that there was a lot, we had kind of had to fill in holes with modern art history. So we started bringing modern art uh, into the summit framework in 2016. And this is a, a beautiful um, installation image of an exhibition called Rewind, where we were pairing tapestries by Monica Correa with tapestries made at a similar time by Rashid Chaudhry. And what was really interesting in this period and, and, and doing research on this period of Bangladesh's history was that, you know, Bangladesh actually has the oldest biennial that still exists in Asia. It's called the Asian Art Biennial, and it started in 1981 by this very dapper man who John mentioned before named um, Syed Jahangir, who sadly recently passed away. But you know, it was when we talk about connecting art histories. He went to Fukuoka. He met fellow he met fellow artists who were very influential um, members in their own art scenes and convinced them to be part of this biennial he was planning in Bangladesh. And at certain times, countries would ref would refuse to be part of it because again, Bangladesh wasn't even ten years old. But the individual artists would arrange their country's participation. So this is him in Fukuoka. And I believe 1980 with a very similar work to what we were showing. So we realized there are these really rich histories of Bangladesh trying to connect and form new ways for the world to see itself or for the world to see Bangladesh, but also how Bangladesh 
would see itself relative to the world, in this sense in an Asian context. Um, and we thought it would be wonderful to invite emerging scholars in. So in the way, um, thinking about seismic movements, it's these emerging voices, their meeting can find new connections and write new art histories. So maybe we'll see this in 10, 20 years to come. It's not about the nine day art event. Um, this is an image of works from the 1980s by an artist collective in Bangladesh called the Shomoy Group, which we showed. So all of the public and participants were able to meet artists behind this movement and also access these works, many of which are normally in private collections. Um, this was another section, um, and I guess we'll get into this more, but the history of famine is something that also connects um, Africa, South and Southeast Asia. And Elizabeth, Elizabeth Georges uh, from Ethiopia and Sanjukta Sundarasan looking at a Bengal perspective were really able to um, tell scholarly stories through artworks about these shared histories that don't normally come together. So this was, again, another like, curatorially such a wonderful experience to be able to show works by Zainal Abedin, Somnath Hor, and Esim Sultan with um, a work by a contemporary artist um, named Tao Nguyen Phan from Vietnam who was looking at uh, famine in that context. And they're both connected through colonial histories with Jute. Um, so this is an image from, so everything we do is building toward the next thing, nothing is, is static. So we knew that we wanted to do this program in 2020 and we began by, um, you know, inviting scholars in for 2018. So this was um, a scholars, we, can, we, we convened indigenous um, scholars led by Katia Garcia Anton at Oka for something called a critical writing ensemble. Um, Shabir Hussein Mustafa from the National Gallery of Singapore arranged a symposium um, about Ananda Kumaraswamy and a guy, Trispivak, also gave a keynote lecture. Um, and this kind of led to this wonderful initiative that I hope continues to grow and find its own legs elsewhere in the world. And I guess since we're always building toward the next thing, what's kind of in my mind is like, could a region be about states of mind, states of existence, states of struggle rather than nation states? And how and where do the struggles in South Asia connect outside of what's on the map? And it's wonderful to have patrons, you know, from all over the world who are interested in this and, you know, seeing again, like 223 people registered for this talk. Um, so it's very encouraging to see that other people are thinking along these lines too. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Diana. Um, my name is uh, Amy Sodin, and um, I was one of the participants, um, one of the emerging scholars um, as part of the um, program. And um, my research is really around connecting these histories to Asia and Africa in a deeply historical sense. And, and a lot of my work has, has been centered around this. I'm just going to share my screen. So since 2014, I've been exploring histories and biographies of enslavement in a South African context. A legacy of the Dutch East India Company, or the VOC, enslaved people were brought to South Africa from present-day India, Indonesia, Madagascar, Mozambique, Angola, and elsewhere to build and service the Dutch colony. And this trade was later taken over by the British, and by the end of slavery in the British Empire in 1834, there were approximately 36,000 enslaved people in the province of the Western Cape alone. The, mechani the mechanisms of slavery in South Africa, with particular emphasis on the province of the Western Cape, have been documented and significant research has been done in chronicling historical events in the region. However, in comparison to other, history, other fields of history in South Africa, these experiences of enslavement remain considerably under-researched. In this region, scholars and researchers are compelled to work with fragmentary biographies of the enslaved in a partially complete archive. And I'm particularly interested in the ways in which contemporary artists are working with fragmentary histories in the creation of new work. Avery Gordon, in the introduction to her book, Ghostly Matters, Haunting and the Sociological Imagination, uses the phrase, her shape and his hand to refer to the power implicit in the formation of an historical account through the white male gaze. The historically framed individual, Gordon is careful to state, is exceedingly delicate in this archival fragmentary form, and more delicate still is the process of drawing out details in the midst of archival dead ends and unreliable narrators. 
I've been drawn to the project of her shape and his hand long before I had the vocabulary to articulate it, and certainly longer than I'd realized the recurrence of this phenomenon in innumerable historical texts. Ansla van Bengalen, for instance, a formerly enslaved woman who was from Bengal and a powerful historical figure from the 17th century, appears in the archive as a shape formed by his hand. My knowledge of ben Bengalen is refracted through the multiple accounts of her by historians and archivists, and further still by her living descendants who have mythologized a version of her memory. As I came to this point in my research, I realized it was, pivot, it was vital for me to pivot away from this narrative around deficit and lack as it, as it concerned the archive. How is the fragmentary archive made generative? What new work is produced in response to questions of loss? I returned to the work of contemporary South African artist, Bernie Searle, who produced the groundbreaking performance work, Color Me, in 1999. And this work has become a cornerstone of South African performance art. In these bodies of work, Searle grapples with the economies of slavery as cargo and human life were deemed one and the same. And here, I'm specifically interested in how the living descendants of these histories, like myself, keep the memory of these histories alive in the present. And alongside these examples of contemporary art, I was also left with how to interpret the passing down of a pencil portrait of a formerly enslaved woman within her white descendant family from generation to generation. This is Anna de Koenen, the daughter of Ansla van Bengalen, and her portrait was shown at the 2017 exhibition, Good Hope, South Africa and the Netherlands from 1600 at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. This tension around cultural inheritance within a deeply racialized and gendered contemporary South African context is at the heart of what could be called a classified visuality. This reading of the other begins from the arrival of the Dutch and in the centuries following has become an increasingly fraught and compounded space imposed by the racial codes of the British colony and later the apartheid regime, um, which was founded in 1948. These shifting racial codes and the implementation in the archive over time further complicate how we interpret the roles and the dynamics between the individuals in the era of enslavement and how we interpret how people carry on these legacies in the present. As I mentioned earlier, I began this project in 2014, and by the time I took part in Mahasa in Hong Kong in 2019, I'd largely been working on my own as I wasn't enrolled in an academic program. Seminars with Prof. Dadi, Dr. Simon Soon, and Dr. Elizabeth Georges were particularly helpful for me in expanding the scope of my research. And Dr. Soon's approach to the archival has been incredibly influential for me through his use of the speculative as it relates to historical research. And having had the opportunity to work with the Mahasa faculty in a very intensive program, I was able to develop my thinking around the project in quite a short period of time, which then led me to prepare my application for, my PhD pro for the PhD program in art history at the University of Witwatersrand, where I enrolled earlier this year. Getting to work with scholars in adjacent research areas has been exceedingly generative, motivating, and challenging. And it was wonderful to have the opportunity to connect with uh, scholars working in the VOC um, Indian Ocean world as incredibly uh, uh, groundbreaking for me, in, to be frank. Um, and I would like to extend my thanks to the Mahasa faculty and the organizers for bringing us all together and for offering us the space and the time to forge these links. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy, for your presentation uh, and um, also to the conveners of uh, this event and, of course, uh, those who initiated the two Mahasa workshops. Uh, I'm really grateful to be part of this session. Uh, it's wonderful to connect with some of you uh, virtually and, of course, to be joined by so many others uh, at this moment. Um, as I share my screen, uh, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction. Um, I'm, uh, my name is Akshay. I'm an art historian and I work on modern and contemporary South Asian art uh, and visual culture. 
um, and I'm particularly interested in the relationship between aesthetics and politics, post-colonialism, and indigeneity in India. Uh, now, the work I got to share uh, uh, and develop uh, through the Mahasa workshops is from my doctoral dissertation uh, titled An Aesthetics of Endurance, Art, Visual Culture, and Indigenous Presence in Nagaland, India. And just to give you a little context about uh, where uh, the place I study is, um, yeah, um, Nagaland is a predominantly indigenous and Christian state in Northeast India, uh, on the border with Myanmar and close to China. And I should mention that the official term to refer to indigenous communities in the region and India more broadly is tribe or uh, scheduled tribe. Now, over the mid to late 20th century, uh, Nagaland was home uh, to an armed movement for political autonomy uh, that was transnational and transregional in scope. Uh, it is a region that the Indian state has governed in a colonialist manner, militarizing it, suppressing regional aspirations for sovereignty, perpetrating human rights abuses, and stifling independent journalism. Now, beginning in 1997, the Indian state signed a series of ceasefire agreements with the region's major Naga nationalist organization. And their subsequent renewal uh, remains the basis of a tenuous stability uh, even today. My research uh, explores the tensions that animate the reconstitution of indigenous cultural forms as art and as heritage, history, sovereignty, and indigenous rights in post ceasefire Nagaland, that is after 1997. Uh, and these tensions, uh, as I see them, uh, play out in conversation with the religious and ritual qualities of these indigenous cultural forms. Now, what do I mean by this? Let me give you a brief sense uh, of uh, my primary research objects to explain this. Uh, in the thesis, I consider craft objects by art school trained artists that draw on the ritual qualities of indigenous cultural forms, Christian ideas, uh, discourses of quote-unquote tribal craft and of course recent political history of the region to visualize warrior and spirit icons anew which entails negotiating, negotiating particular kinds of anxieties as well. So for instance in 2005 identified by the Baptist residents of uh, a village um, for uh, making a quote-unquote pagan statue that visualized an indigenous lake spirit the artist Lepton Jamil defended his woodcut public sculpture by exclaiming, I am a Naga and an artist, which highlights the kinds of tensions that animate both indigenous art and the publics they engender in contemporary Nagaland. I also look at uh, memorial monuments to fallen Naga soldiers that re spatialize the corporeal qualities of the indigenous cultural form of the stone monolith. Now, in the Angami Naga language term, uh, the stone model, it translates quite literally as a planted stone. Uh, so I look at how it re-spatializes this form alongside uh, the Christian tombstone. Now these are erected along highways and outside villages um, uh, in Nagaland. These monuments quite literally perform, as I see it, Naga sovereignty in a resolute form that contests the Indian state's publicization of post ceasefire Nagaland as a land of quote-unquote tribal festivals. Additionally, their scalar qualities echo those of countless Second World War memorials and commemorative stones uh, that dot places like Kohima, uh, where the Battle of Kohima was fought in 1944. Now, when I asked a member of a Naga, Naga nationalist organization if these monuments were in opposition uh, to the state, he responded by saying that the monuments weren't political projects, but a post-death family practice that happened to also be politically significant which indicated to me that the newness of these monuments does not simply conform to the modernist narrative of evolutionary succession, but the endurance and reconstitution of an indigenous form of collective memory as well. And lastly, uh, I look at house museums uh, founded by Naga Christian priests that are dedicated to Naga history, including narrating the history of Christianity and of the Naga nationalist movement, which encompass, as I see it, exhibitionary practices and spectatorial forms associated with the indigenous male dormitory and the rich man's house, and as well with the secular modernist uh, form of the museum. Like the memorial monuments, 
these house museums are strongly shaped by the regional spread of the globally constituted Christian ideas of enculturation and liberation theology, um, which were constituted across places in Latin America and Africa, and which spawned a theologically motivated regional embrace of indigenous practice as culture and heritage uh, from the 1980s onwards in the region that I study. Now, broadly stated, I argue that the significance of these objects as art, and even their contested resignification as history, heritage, and sovereignty today uh, lies in their proximity to, rather than distance from, their efficacies as re religious and ritual media, which art history must contend with. And relatedly, I argue that these objects in encapsulate a plural and layered conception of time and space, which militates against the primitivist image of an archaic past, uh, or, and also of a present ruptured from the past, and these are the two kinds of sort of images that one associates um, uh, with indigeneity. So they sort of militate against both these ideas of indigeneity. Rather, as I see it, they showcase an aesthetics of endurance and emergence that demonstrates that the indigenous present is co-constituted by indigenous practices, uh, Christianity, and the cosmopolitan influences uh, that have shaped Naga political formations under settler colonial conditions of governance practiced by the post-colonial Indian state. And this aesthetics of endurance and emergence, I contend, illuminates new cultural histories uh, of the monument, uh, the house museum, and craft outside, uh, or in addition rather, to the singular paradigm of modernity. And in contrast, uh, my work also highlights that Indian discourses of tribal craft which emerged as part of the nationalist art movement in India in the early 20th century uh, and nurtured multiple national modernisms through much of the 20th century, uh, also undermined the heterogene heterogeneity of indigenous cultural practices by securing them to Hindu-centric ideas of craft and culture, uh, which, as I see it, casts new light on a post-colonial genealogy of primitivism that marginalizes the contemporary contemporaneity and ever-changing reality of indigenous art, life worlds, and lived realities. Now, I benefited from the Mahasa workshops in a number of ways. Um, uh, firstly, the format of the two workshops, which entailed a close engagement uh, with considerably different projects uh, over a sort of relatively short, but sort of lengthy 10-day period, uh, a rich set of readings and sort of passionate discussions that ensued in each session, uh, and an opportunity uh, to see and learn from the work of um, artists, curators, and gallerists in both Hong Kong and Dhaka, which is in, invaluable, uh, really pushed me to think closely about the resonances uh, between modern and contemporary arts practices in considerably different locales and contexts. Um, and in close conversation with a number of the participants, um, I began to think about, in relation to my own work, uh, to sharpen what I see as resonances, not similarities or, or sameness, but resonances between the quite different narratives of indigenous art and cultural practice in the part of South Asia that I study and what North American indigenous scholars call survivance or forms of indigeneity that exceed civilizational discourses, while also paying close attention to the considerably different uh, contexts of indigeneity that these regions present. And lastly, Mahasa has also pushed me to consider debates on uh, comparative indigeneity, post-colonialism, and global modernisms in my own research, which has both informed my PhD uh, and continues to inform my current work as well. Uh, thank you, and I'll pass it over to uh, Mohammed. Thank you, um, Akshay. Um, can you guys see my uh, screen, full screen? Okay. So thank you, Mahasa. Uh, Mahasa fellow, mentors, um, and organizers. I hope you're all safe in these uh, trying times. This is Muhammad Rahman. Muhammad Rahman, I'm an assistant professor at the School of De uh, Design at the University of Cincinnati. And also I'm pursuing my PhD um, in architecture as well. So my research was based in Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh. 
urban streetscapes here are not just a production of physical environments. Dhaka streets can claim and um, appropriate it as an everyday practice of social production. So these unstudied typographic assemblages intersect with the public and private urban fabric. Dhaka has been the historic center of 1952 language movement in post-colonial East Pakistan, which led to the liberation war in 1971, and Bangladesh became an independent nation state. Between 1952 and 71, every urban political demonstration predominantly used um, Bengali letter forms as symbolic articulation of national identity. Public institution and art college students got closely involved in the production of typographic form by curating Bengali language as a valiant symbol of pride and possession. By 1960s, um, Dhaka University campus became the political pilgrimage. It became a theater of demonstration where modern architecture with wall surfaces were also getting visible in the campus. Expanding upon the potential on, of the street as a venue, the wall write, writings and artworks were manifested as a vehicle for public propaganda and dialogue. The phrases from children's alphabet book was uh, transformed into political metaphors with powerful illustrations depicting the sociopolitical and national ethos of Dhaka University campus, which also give rise to an active student politics around that late 60s. My current research focuses on how um, the urban letter forms of Dhaka University area can provide a different aperture to read the city. The empirical research tries to foreground the ephemeral and visual landscape of urban typography, which can um, be considered as an alternative genealogy of the city by constructing an archival source. In a way, the scholarship wants to project a new method to understand the kinetic transformation and analyze the significance of Bengal letter forms to delineate uh, the cultural informality. There has been no systematic ethnographic study or taxonomy on these Bengali legible artifacts um, in um, the urban uh, streetscape except unburied veneration. The aspiring study of urban typography uh, in around Dhaka University area tries to reveal a complex post-colonial Dhaka convulsed by the series of political movements over three decades and transformed by the forces of globalization in the late, late 80s. During the Mahasa seminars in Dhaka, I started the field uh, research uh, from newspaper curriculums, um, political party offices, uh, library and social media resources, along with artists' personal collections and works. The interviews with veteran artists um, from around 70s unpacked how to categorize the typographic variation by understanding political power structure. These typographic forms were emerging from rapid and artisanal quality, which might have created a territory in typographic development later in Bangladesh. Artistic aesthetic ruled over legibility in design and pedagogic um, innovation. Typography becomes a unique political vernacular in ubiquitous mass culture. Um, also, the personal stories were worth noticing betrays the economies. Institutional patronage and multifaceted artworks have been char changing the dimension of these urban artifacts. It was crucial to identify the artisan voices of this aesthetic production and how they identify themselves as well. Economic forces and vernacular capital have already shifted towards digital signage. The wall writings of Dhaka are starkly legible and thereby build mass solidarity. An in-depth typographic taxonomy can project the socio-political structure and disparate practices of production. Predominant urban political typography can be critically questioned how post-colonial contestation and activism had, have manifested public space in East Pakistan and still have influences on Bangladeshi urban culture. Resonating from Brahmi roots, Bengali script also has this or, um, organic relationship between orthogonal and tangential lines. The thick strokes of public art visually appear as an influence combination of interpreted broken shapes of Bengal letter forms. Again, by creating this whole handmade tradition as a vernacular capital. This is very unique to Dhaka, stylistically different from the practices of Bengal school in Shantiniketan. Here, the urban breeding grounds of nationalistic 
secularism, projection of modernity and a political act of dissemination can be tied in one thread. It is contextualized that the tension between post-colonial nationalism and its appropriation by Bengalis in the form of applying letter forms to the modernist and colonial buildings of Dhaka University. The unique urban phenomena is challenging the singularity of objective <clears throat> of a particular architecture. Rather, the building becomes the form of signage. It encouraged to see the city as a ubiquitous saturation of urban experience. Architecture become the unfurling facade. It is establishing the right to the city. Here, I um, need to mention that I'm one of those Mahasa participants with a combination of architecture and graphic design without any a priori background in art history, which actually opened up a lot of other micro and macro tangents in my research. For a practicing designer and educator, Mahasa was an inclusive provocation. It connected parallel scholarship in the region and beyond to question methods of inquiry. I think Mahasa endorsed with its divergent trajectories that the word nationalist identity should be questioned and how linguistic nationalism can be problematic as um, it always tends to dominate the other form of expression. For instance, the 1952 language movement also became a hegemonic apparatus by itself as a conscious effort of marginalization. In both the sessions in Hong Kong and Dhaka, um, I was intrigued by um, the cellular parallels between fascinating synthesis and dissemination of knowledge across geography and the Indian Ocean world. So I personally thank uh, the partnership between Getty Foundation, ICN, Asia Art Archive, Hong Kong, and Dhaka Art Summit for creating this uh, amazing platform, Mahasa. Thanks. Um, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you, uh, Mohammed, and uh, I want to thank you as well uh, to the organizers of this event from ICM and SAP and for uh, from Hasa as well. Uh, I'm Anissa and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a PhD candidate here at Cornell in the Art History Department and I'm also a part-time uh, assistant curator in the art in the art uh, Asian Art Department at the Johnson Art Museum here at Cornell. Um, so I'm just going to go uh, directly to my work. So my research, um, Islam and Art in the Making of the Modern in Indonesia, um, focuses on the works and lives of Indonesian artists who take critical approaches to um, questions of art and aesthetics from the West as they seek to negotiate their lived traditions related to Islamic practice, philosophy, and theology. I suggest that each artwork produced by Muslim artists in modern Indonesia becomes a site of ethical and affective encounters and tension as it constructs and communicates different values, identities, and desires relating to discourses of Islamic authenticity and proper religiosity. Uh, their works show how visual culture constitutes an important realm of quote-unquote permanent revolution as they respond to and oppose existing aesthetic conventions using new languages of representation to challenge doctrine, authority, or specific moral teaching. Genealogy matters significantly in my research as all of uh, four artists that I'm working with graduated from the same school. Uh, international and modernism arrived in the Dutch East Indies uh, through the establishment of this school the first art training institution in Bandung was Java, Universiteit Leerhang for the Oplating van Teken Leraar, that was established in 1947. And it was funded by the Dutch colonial government during the period of the Indonesian Revolution. The school is now known as the Faculty of Art and Design, Institute Technology Bandung, or Bandung Institute of Technology. Uh, my manuscript discusses four artists from different generations of artistic training in Bandung. So Ahmad Sadali, Ade Perus, Harya Diswadi, and Arahmayani. Uh, each artist grapples with different notions of what it, what it means to be a modern artist and to be a Muslim during the period of authoritarian regime and its aftermath with its fluctuating policies and attitudes towards Islam. The works by Ahmad Sadali and Ade Perus that represent early generation of artistic training in Bandung show more clearly their engagement 
with the principles of modernism introduced by their Dutch teachers. Their modernist training also allowed them to negotiate their Muslim identities through the incorporations of Quranic calligraphy into their abstract paintings. For Sadali and Perus, um, the modernist abstract art possessed the same spirits of universalism and intellectualism as Islam. Their practice of calligraphic modernism that began in the, lead, in the late 1960s and early 70s quickly developed as the canonical representation of modern Islamic art in Indonesia. Even until today, modern Islamic art in Indonesia is still imagined through Sadalis and Peru's paintings that prioritized legibility and measured by the importance of the artist's religious piety. Haria Diswari and Arahmayani's works uh, stand in contrast to Sadali and Pirus's understanding of modernity and Islam. Haredi's position is comparatively marginal, both in the history of um, modern art and modern Islamic art in Indonesia. Unlike Sadali and Pirus, who defined the modern and the Islamic as global and universal, Haredi pushed forward the localized form of modernism and Islam through his works. Haredi's visualities of illegible calligraphy and symbolism derived from localized international Sufi order in Java challenged the mainstream idea of modern Islamic art and confronted the boundaries and limitations set by Islamic orthodoxy and new order in Indonesia. Aramayani, on the other hand, is globally known for her performance, installation, and collaborative works with different communities across different geographies. Aramayani's works are rarely framed, however, as Islamic and more as part of the feminist projects and the secular development of modern and contemporary art in post-colonial Indonesia and Southeast Asia. However, her method of acknowledging and confronting violence towards Islam through using her own body, including the ones perpetrated by the Muslim majority towards others, offers a critical edge that radically departs from the works of uh, all male artists, such as Sadali and Perus. Her works and her um, quote unquote, syncretic approach to Islam to reassert and connect the experiences of marginal bodies of women and minorities through her nomadic self that disrupts the mainstream ideas and the orthodox iterations of Islam. And through Mahasa, um, I it's it's uh, it, it was a wonderful experience, and um, I through the sessions and uh with Mahasa faculties and with the participants and the discussions, uh, I get to learn the different points of views and perspectives in discussing about uh, modernism and about modernity uh, uh, across Asia and Africa. And to find uh, points of connections and meaningful connection and how each of us approach our research and our topics. Um, and I think that to learn about this, uh, to learn about these various approaches, uh, and how uh, each of uh, the participants and how, how each of the faculties have articulated uh, their approach to modernity and modern and contemporary art in their respective fields and areas helped me to articulate my approach um, as well. One of the important things that I've uh, gathered from this. Uh, uh, from this workshop is the importance of amplifying uh, voices of, of local scholars and artists and how they have redefined modernity and, and modernism. Um, and I think Mahasa was designed with solidarity and collaboration in mind. And we have, uh, we had a lot of generative discussions and collaborative works during our workshop and it has continued until today. Uh, so yeah, thank you. And I'll pass it to Ming Tiampo, one of our faculties, Mahasa faculties.
Hello, and thank you um, for your presentation, everyone. Um, and thank you for inviting me to this panel. Um, it has been such a privilege to be a part of Ms. Hassa. And um, really, as a faculty member, it was one of the most thrilling um, experiences that I've ever had teaching in terms of being part of this exciting um, community where um, we were co-teaching with um, faculty members who have um, specializations from other regions, and also in the context of Asia Art Archive and DACA Art Summit's tremendous resources, expertise, and vision. Um, there was just such an exciting moment of um, being able to learn from each other, um, from the other faculty. Um, so it was a very unusual situation from a teaching perspective in which we actually sat through the seminars of all of the other faculty and were able to learn from them as well, building our own um, knowledge of global art histories, but also thinking through, you know, what all of the participants were thinking about as well, that we were learning from um, each other the entire time. And as you can see from some of these photographs, um, the seminars were um, not state affairs so much as they were real discussions where we were um, you know, thinking through different problematics together, coming up with new methodologies, and um, understanding the histories that we all brought to the table. Um, in very um, sedimented ways. So it was very, very exciting teaching experience for me and hopefully um, for the others and for our participants. Um, we also spent some time going into the field. Now I'm having a little bit of trouble with my presentation, which is not moving forward. There we go. Um, in the field, we when the first moment when we arrived in Hong Kong, we were already immersed into um, new experiences with um, the protests in Hong Kong um, for democracy. Um, we arrived and we were immersed into the city. Um, as you can see, I, I've got a photograph here of the inside of the Chongqing mansions. Um, so you can get a sense of what that felt like. Um, it was a, a radically global space. Um, and it was a way for us to think about globalization from the bottom up, which is very much the spirit that we were um, pursuing in Mahasa. It was um, about trying to understand how each of the various histories that we brought to um, our conversations were entangled and um, what kinds of relational comparisons we could draw from them. Um, as you can see on the right hand side, um, we also went in Dhaka to the National Parliament House um, by architects Louis Khan and Muzrahil Islam and um, were treated to a, a wonderful um, lecture and um, tour by our very own Nurur Khan who took us through the building on which he did his dissertation. Um, so again, we were learning from our, all of our participants um, and it was a, a deeply meaningful experience for all of us. Um, in addition to the seminars, um, we also had presentations as part of the Dhaka Art Summit and we were very much a part of um, this world stage, this um, site that um, the, the Dr. Art Summit um, convened to bring us all together, um, bringing us uh, the opportunity to lay the intel intellectual foundations for new comparative and connected approaches to art history. It was really, truly a privilege um, to participate in nurturing this new um, generation of scholars, um, in which I would include myself, um, for whom comparative approaches are imagined as in a worldly manner, um, that they are were articulated in relation to one another and to other sites which have experienced similar conditions of colonization, oppression, and struggles for liberation. So this new relational approach is something that um, we were coming to together and that this approach to comparison proposed new ways of decolonizing both comparative studies and also area studies, encouraging lateral and structural thinking, um, as we have seen in some of the projects that we've shared with you today. So, you know, even just from today's presentations, 
um, I think you'll see that it's not just about a juxtaposition of individual projects, but actually um, a new worldview, a new kind of thinking through um, these projects that is building new connections and new ways of understanding comparison um, through, uh, for example, um, Amy's um, comment about um, how Simon Soon's speculative methodologies um, opened up the way she was doing research to the new networks that she built um, with other scholars working in the VOC Indian Ocean world, or the way that Akshay's um, work on um, encapsulating plural and layered time and space, thinking through um, a present a, a kind of temporality that is quite different from previous understandings of the Nagaland, so that we could see both not, um, a present that is not ruptured for the from the past, and also not located in a primitive past, which it, he built out of a kind of study of comparative indigeneities, right? So it's um, not just a question of finding parallel cases, but also understanding new methodologies that one could extract and build together from these um, conversations that we were having. Um, Anissa's project um, on um, uh, thinking through local definitions of modernism and the ways in which solidarity and co co collaboration um, emerged in all of these conversations was actually extreme, is key to um, the, the project of Mahasa, that this was so much about a kind of um, solidarity building exercise. It was about building networks and trying to find new ways of collaborating. Um, which is something that really came to um, the fore in our experiences. And finally, Mohammed's um, project um, really showed the ways in which these parallels um, with his project helped to put pressure on the ideas of nationalist identity um, as not just something that is articulated through the, the written word itself and um, that sort of um, offered opportunities for liberation, but that it could itself also be a kind of hegemonic apparatus. Again, something that was pulled out through these um, parallel um, case studies. So, you know, it, when we're thinking a little bit about um, the kinds of experiences that we had here and the kinds of um, ways forward, I think um, I'd really like to point to um, what Anissa was saying about two, uh, these two words, solidarity and collaboration, which have been so meaningful to what we do. Um, and I think it's important for us to think about, you know, what is next? Um, as as Diana was saying, nothing is um, static at the DACA Art Summit. And so it's very much about um, trying to figure out where we can go from here. And so just to give you all a, a sense of what has been going on after um, these two extraordinary meetings that we had, um, we have been having an ongoing community that has been sustained through digital communications. Um, you should see our What's, What's App. Um, it's this um, wonderful site where, you know, People who um, have research questions will write in and will get answers from three or four specialists from the field, or somebody else will write in and say, oh, does anybody have this, um, this article that I can't act? Access, um, because I don't have electronic resources and th you know three or four other people will write in with the PDFs um, so you know really from the intellectual resources um, to, to material resources um, there has been uh, the building of an incredibly generous community um, that also celebrate career milestones such as new jobs publications and exhibitions and, you know, really what I see coming out of this is the establishment of a new field um, beyond colonial categories, um, beyond area studies, beyond um, it, the a previous model of comparative studies, um, creating something that is really very fresh, that um, doesn't necessarily have to root itself through um, Western um, histories and Western methodologies, but really 
thinking from different regions to, to imagine new worlds. Um, so this is something that I, um, I have found very inspiring and feel extremely privileged to have been a part of. So um, my sincere thanks to um, Iftikhar and to Diana, um, to Amara, to John, um, to Asia Art Archive, the DACA Art Summit, and Getty for making this all possible for all of us. So my job now is to, um, really to, here, hang on, um, be the moderator. Um, we have about 15 minutes for questions and answers. And I think that, hang on. Um, could somebody please take off my screen share? Perfect, thank you. Uh, we have a number of questions and answers already in the Q&A box. I would invite all of you um, to write in with more questions, which I will read out and um, pose to the group. I will start with um, this question by Brian Arnold. And it says, in putting together this Pan-Asian African history, this, um, sorry, these, uh, this work on Pan-Asian African histories, is there some thought of or acknowledgement of Sukarno's great initiative, the Bandung Conference? And I will open up the field to all of our panelists. Would somebody like to take this? Um, hello, thanks for the question. I just uh, begin by answering that, uh, of course, Bandung is a, is a very important milestone in uh, definitely the histories of decolonization, especially the political and uh, you know, histories of sovereignty. And uh, it intersects with uh, developments in art, okay? But uh, um, in some ways, um, if one were to find a direct correlation of Bandung to artwork, that would be a harder job to do. In other words, it's the spirit of Bandung, really. Okay, the spirit of uh, decolonization and uh, of uh, of uh, creating solidarities in the global south that uh, expresses itself actually in the modern art of various places that some of us have been studying. But I would uh, I would be careful in making a one to one correlation between specific political events and their uh, direct expression into artwork. Thank you, Iftikhar. Are there any other comments? So I will read out an, another question here. Thank you everyone for your generous, video, your generous sharing. This is from Bing Hao Wong. I'm interested to learn how gender figures into dialogues across national and regional formations and localized convoluted renditions of a universal modernism. Perhaps this is a question directed to Amy and Anissa. Thank you. So Amy and Anissa. Okay, I'll, I'll start off. Um, as, as many scholars have found who are interested in, in, in gender and um, working in this area. Sorry, I can't seem to share my video. Oh, there we go. Um, gender is a, and it has become something of a cliche, gender is largely absent <laughs> and has been largely absent in how, in how these histories have been written. And so to, to discuss and to consider gender and histories of modernism is to do what could be called reparative work and, and what I see as reparative work. Um, considering gender completely shifts and flips the way that we understand narratives of agency, um, self-actualization, um, and, and the various decisions that people make in making art or simply surviving. Um, and I think that that is something that really typifies um, modernism perhaps in a South African or an African context is, you know, these multiple struggles that are running alongside each other all the time. Um, and, and this work that then takes away from, from one's ability to produce as an artist or 
or the kind of recognition one might receive as a writer, for instance. Um, and um, this was particularly evident in learning from uh, Prof. Elizabeth uh, Georges, who said that she, you know, she had to actively seek out um, modern artists um, from Ethiopia um, for her book um, because uh, there were people who weren't working anymore for various reasons. Um, and, and this is very much a pattern um, across, I think, a number of regions. Um, yeah, I'll hand over to Anissa. Actually, before Anissa answers, um, I just want to add a second question, which is a related question from Natasha Basun Nauf. Um, Anissa, thank you so much for that amazing presentation. Always appreciate learning more about your work. I was particularly intrigued by the last artist you mentioned, and I am curious, is there room to expand this feminist critique of Islam in Indonesian art? And if so, how might you go about that? Or might there be, what might be the, article, the obstacles? Great, uh, thank you for the questions, Bing and Natasha, and uh, thank you, Amy uh, and Ming. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with, uh, with Amy uh, to look at gender as a as, as sort of parative. And, uh, and my discussions of Arahmayani, um, I also look at Arahmayani uh, within the framework of, of reparative uh, readings. Um, and it's really um, important, I think, if we talk about uh, 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 modernist uh, modernist art um, that developed uh, in Indonesia in the 60s and 70s by the works of Sadali and Pirus, you see uh, it's a more sort of uh, detached way of looking at realities and of presenting realities as well that is not always uh there's not always easily uh recognizable and it's also uh their abstract works is also very cold and, and, and masculine in a way that many that artists women artists who work uh with modernist abstraction during that time period they either have to have to uh conform to that so they have to appear uh, masculine as well in their works uh and arahmayani's works i think uh really mark a, uh, marks a departure from that. And it really, uh, it really departs from this um, mode of, of looking uh, inward as well that, uh, that, that happened with Sadalis and Perus. So her works looks more uh, outside and, and trying to collaborate with uh, different communities and different, different uh, people across uh, Southeast, across Indonesia and across Southeast Asia and across uh, uh, different parts of the world uh, and trying to uh, look at Islam and trying to sort of deconstruct these stereotypical notions about Islam that, that uh, are, uh, that were circulated by the global media, but also the stereotypical notion of Islam that, uh, that that are circulated by Muslims themselves. So there's two sort of fronts of, of battles in Aramayani's works that she has to deal with. And um, yeah, and I think her work uh, try to connect people together in, uh, and, and uh, work side by side and trying to uh, find a different way of, of looking and Islam and art as well. Thank you. Thank you, Anissa. Um, so can I, I say something? Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to ask about time because there are so many questions that are very exciting here. Um, should, do we have time for one more question or do we have time for a few more? Um, yeah, let's go for another 10 minutes, I think. For another 10 minutes? Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to just say regarding the first question or regarding Pandum, there was, uh, please see also the conference called Access of Solidarity that was held at the Tate. Um, and uh, it was a, a, a collaboration between uh, ICM and uh, Tate Modern. And uh, I, I, put the, I put the link in the, in the chat for everyone. 
Okay, um, we have a question here from Meinel Abedin, um, who comments that we know very little about Nagaland in the field of art history. And I thought I would give Akshay a, 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 an opportunity to respond to that comment um, very quickly. Thanks, Ming. Um, yes, that's, a, a, that's, a, that's an interesting comment because when I started uh, uh, doing my research, uh, that was my initial impression as well. Uh, but as one starts to work on any particular topic or area, one realizes actually that there is a lot that is uh, present in terms of literature on um, art, 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 art practice and art history in Nagaland. Um, so there is actually uh, a fairly wide ranging sort of uh, scholarship on regional art. Um, among the sort of more uh, sort of conventional studies are those by uh, the Indian sociologist uh, Verrier Elwin. Um, there is work by uh, people like Stella Cramrish, who's also involved in sort of establishing art history in uh, late colonial and early post-independence period in India. Uh, and uh, Naga does figure in uh, the major festivals of India campaign that was started in the 1980s by the Indian government uh, around the world. Um, uh, held, they held exhibitions in the United States at the Smithsonian, uh, in London, uh, in Paris, uh, in Moscow, uh, even in uh, Japan at that time. Uh, so um, the Naga does circulate uh, uh, quite widely during these moments, uh, but these are sort of, uh, in comparison to other regional uh, art histories, um, they're very slight, they occupy a sort of marginal position. But within Nagaland as, as well, there's been a, a fairly healthy sort of uh, tradition of uh, scholarship. So uh, figures like Alem Chiba Ao, Milada Ganguly have written about it in the past. There are a number of uh, art critics uh, that one can turn to in the present. Um, um, but uh, what I've really sort of learned from uh, both from Hasa and in my sort of broader research is that uh, in order to actually sort of expand uh, our understanding of regional arts practices, we also need to expand the way we think about uh, material practice. Uh, and so draw from other literature as well, other scholarships. So I've uh, found it to be incredibly useful to uh, delve into uh, uh, anthropological research, religious studies, the work of religious studies scholars. Uh, so there's figures like Arkutong Longkumer, uh, Vibha Joshi, uh, who have written about material practice uh, in very exciting ways uh, that actually sort of uh, speaks back to concerns of art history and allows uh, as um, Iftikhar pointed out in his initial comments, uh, to really sort of uh, break out of the sort of canonical mode of thinking about uh, art and its histories. Um, and um, yeah, so, so the, the, uh, we both know very little and we actually know quite a bit uh, that we can draw on. Um, and really, I think uh, the Mahasa workshop, some of the other participants and faculty members research also sort of speaks to uh, expanding the way we think about uh, art and its histories. Thank you, Akshaya. Um, I think I will, oops, sorry, I can't see this. There's a question here from um, Adnan Razvi um, about diaspora and, um, and regional art histories. How do we better bridge creative communities for children of immigrants and the diaspora in the West and align between those that never left. I feel the shared dialogue and merger needs to happen. Post-colonialism, I feel things are compartmentalized. This lecture and program is very powerful. So who would like to field this question about connecting art histories between diaspora and regions and thinking about global Asias and global Africas? Um, no, thank you for that, uh, for that question. Uh, I mean, one of the problems we see actually in, um, in, in Asia and Africa is that there's a lot of unevenness in the way art history is uh, researched and taught. Uh, there are, you know, there are large countries in, let's say, Africa and Asia where they, there's not even a single art history department. So I think the question partly uh, Mahasa was also very much, uh, you know, attentive to 
to this lack and that is why we try to recruit as many uh, students you know and participants as possible from really you know the global south okay who are actually living and working there and uh, and also faculty who are living there and i think the the, the i think the uh, you know the more we can share and collaborate and you know develop our thinking and resources together the better off we'll all be frankly and we will also be able to bridge some of these generational kind of uh, Divides. I guess this is a short answer, but uh, this is uh, this is a much bigger topic, of course. <laughs> but uh, this is a short answer to to the question. Absolutely. Um, so for the final question, I will be reading out two questions that are related. Um, what are some of the collaborative transregional projects that have emerged from the summit, including projects in process or not yet begun? And this is from Emma Natalia Stein, and. Um, Yuna Lee asks, thanks for the opportunity to know about the amazing projects. What is the future application of the research generated, for example, for incorporating to undergraduate and postgraduate teaching programs and publications? I would love to see them in, public, in the public domain for teaching. So I'm curious to hear from our participants about perhaps some projects that um, we don't know about yet um, and then perhaps if Dakar John and I can share um, something that we're working on. Um, perhaps I can answer that. Uh, so I've been working with uh, a curator in the Netherlands and we're, uh, we're planning this exhibition. It's called Modernist Networks. Um, uh, it's about Indonesian artists and their networks of, uh, yeah, and their and their networks in uh, in and across Southeast Asia and South Asia as well. And uh, um, I think we we sort of uh, uh, learned a lot from the Mahasa, and we're trying to make this project uh, uh, by 2024, hopefully. And we're trying to make it. Uh, we're trying to have this project and for uh, different spaces in Indonesia and the Netherlands and um, in the United States. Uh, so we're trying to trace the networks of artists uh, in Indonesia who works and lived in uh, the 40s through the 60s basically and their, uh, their sort of exchanges and encounters with artists and institutions in South Asia and in Southeast Asia and uh, in, in, in addition to in uh, Europe. So that's, yeah, that's what, uh, what, I, what, what we have so far. That's very exciting. Anybody else? Okay, um, so there's a project that Iftikhar and John and I are working on um, right now, which um, gets to the point that Yuna Lee was making, which is that we realized um, when we were at um, actually the 2018 DACA Art Summit, um, and perhaps even before that, um, we started talking about the fact that despite the fact that we're doing all of this um, cutting edge research, thinking about modernisms outside of your Europe and North America, um, on a scholarly level, uh, the teaching of modernism in the academy remains the same and is um, very Eurocentric even now because the teaching resources just don't exist. And so um, we have taken it upon ourselves to work with a, an editorial collective um, to create um, a new source book um, that we're calling Intersecting Modernisms for now. Um, Iftikhar, John, would you like to jump in and say something about our project? Uh, okay, so maybe I'll step in since uh, Iftikhar seems like he's uh, not. <laughs> Uh, so basically, this is, a, I think, a project that has kind of been under discussion for a while, even before Mahasa and kind of in parallel with Mahasa, but definitely, I think, um, has been informed by a lot of the, the, the kind of the thinking 
that came out of Mahasa. So I think Graph Commons, I think, uh, is going to make a make an appearance probably at some point in in this project as well. Um, but um, I think you know one of the things that precisely the project is is intended to to do is to think about the the you know some of the words that we've been using tonight: resonances, um, uh, solidarities, and collaborations, right between different parts of the world. And to really think about modernism from a non-Western perspective, I think you know it's it's not a, it's not a history of modernism in the non-West. It's a history of modernism from the perspective, and I think that's a really kind of exciting and interesting um, point vantage point from which to kind of rethink um, a large chunk of uh, 19th and 20th century history. Actually, that point about it being from a non-Western perspective gets at um, Adnan Razvi's question from earlier about how do we connect diasporic histories to um, regional histories in a larger global narrative um, or through no larger global narratives. And what we're doing in this project is precisely that we will be looking at diasporic and indigenous narratives in Europe and North America and making those connections um, in a global interconnected um, art history. Yeah, and can I, actually there's something that um, I do want to, to point out here, which is that, you know, um, as one of the outcomes, um, I think that came out of Mahasa for me, what I think has been most um, satisfying is not only the kind of, you know, because I think all of us learn so much in as, as part of this experience, just through exposure to each other's projects and you know learning about what everyone is working on but i think that you know connecting our histories as a as a kind of endeavor is not just about kind of advancing knowledge it's also you know it's not just kind of purely intellectual it's also social and i think for me you know as someone kind of one of the organizers for this um it's really been kind of seeing the connections that have been made. So, you know, Amy tonight talked about the the connections that, you know, she or the kind of the 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 importance of the relationship to Elizabeth, for instance, um, as a kind of a relationship, right? Or as a kind of mentor relationship. Or, you know, the um kind of offline, you know, talking with the Mahasa participants um and thinking about the kind of the way that they have continued to be friends with each other, basically, you know, and and what has been really exciting is that, you know, these two 10-day sessions have been kind of anchoring points for people to really develop these kind of, you know, like ongoing relationships and dialogues with one another, which isn't just purely like, oh, I'm working on this, what do you know about that? But also like, hey, what are you, you know, what are you doing? Are you thinking about like, you know, and then also kind of like, thinking about new ways for each other to collaborate. So, you know, um, I was hearing about, um, uh, Samina was telling me that, you know, oh, um, you know, she saw this opportunity for, for a conference and she invited, you know, Sanjoy and, and some, other, some of the other people to, uh, to participate in it. And so that's kind of, you know, ongoing relationship. So it's kind of like, you know, it, starts, it started in Mahasa, but it's going to go beyond Mahasa. And that's kind of really exciting to see, you know, these new networks and these new communities that, that grow out of this. I think that, that is um, just as exciting as any of the intellectual labor, I think that um, that comes out of this. Uh, so I think we are, we've run very late, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, so it's, I think this is a good time to, uh, to end, but uh, please watch out for uh, another event that is being planned by, John is cooking up something. I think. Uh, yeah, I think we, uh, so Asia Art Archive, uh, you know, we hosted a, uh, our colleagues at Asia Archive in America hosted something in June, and we announced it as an as a series. And so uh, I think it will. Uh, we would like to host another uh, panel at least in December. And um, yeah, so stay tuned. So and uh, thank you all for your uh, participation, attendance, and questions. Uh, goodbye. Okay. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>